Hi everyone, um, this week's shared read is called The Day the Rollets Got Their Moxie Back. Now, this um, particular story is, the genre is historical fiction. And so in historical fiction, events and settings are going to be typical of the time period in which the story is about. And you're also going to read about characters who act like and speak the dialect. Dialect is how people talk. So um, people that are from another part of the country speak English primarily, um, but in some areas they speak in a particular dialogue, dialect. So someone that is from the South, like Georgia, um, is going to sound different than us here in California. So they have their own dialect. So the characters will speak the dialect of the people from this particular um, place in the past, wherever this story is set. So before we even get started, I want us to think about this this word, this title, this word moxie in the title. So the word moxie means courage or determination, particularly in times of difficulty. So right now we could be saying that people are demonstrating a lot of moxie um, during this time, you know, with these stay at home orders. Um, this, the first known use of this word was in the 1930s. And we already know this is historical fiction. So one of the things I want to make sure that we know is that in the 30s, um, many countries in the world were experiencing really tough economic times. Um, so there wasn't a lot of money. Um, there was a lot of unemployment. So people weren't able to go to work. They couldn't find jobs. They were getting laid off from their jobs. Um, and this period in history is, no, is known as the Great Depression. And you might have heard of this before studying social studies. So our story, The, Do the Day of the Rollets Got Their Moxie Back, is we're going to be reading about how a family helps one another adapt to change. Sometimes the thing that gets you through hard times comes like a bolt from the blue. That's what my older brother's letter was like traveling across the country from a work camp in Wyoming. It was 1937 and Ricky was helping to build facilities for a new state park as part of President Roosevelt's employment program. Through the program, though the program created jobs for young men like Ricky, it hadn't helped our dad find work yet. Okay, so we can use this first paragraph to really make sure that this is historical fiction, or we can use some details from this first paragraph to help us understand that it's historical fiction. So first, the narrator mentions that it's 1937. So we already know what, you know, what time frame in history the story is taking place. It also states that Ricky is working um, as part of President Roosevelt's work program. Okay, and so President Roosevelt was the president during this time. So we know it's not current. We know that this is taking place. Um, and we know that this program he, he's working in is part of an employment program. So trying to get people to work. I imagined Ricky looking up at snow-capped mountains and sparkling skies breathing in the smell of evergreens as his work crew turned trees into lumber and lumber into buildings. It almost made an 11-year-old weakling like me want to become a lumberjack. Back in our New York City apartment, the air smelled like meatloaf and cabbage. Dad sat slantwise in his chair by the window obviously trying to catch the last rays of sunlight rather than turn on a light. My older sister Ruth and I lay on the floor comparing the letters Ricky had sent us. Surely. Ricky says they had a talent show and he wore a grass skirt and did a hula dance while playing the ukulele, Ruth reported with delight. I'll bet he was the cat's pajamas. So in these two paragraphs, I want us to focus on comparing and contrasting the two settings that were described. So the narrator describes Wyoming. This is where Ricky is. Wyoming is being full of snow-capped mountains. The mountains have snow on the top of them, and it smells of evergreens. 
In contrast, the narrator describes New York City, her apartment, as being dimly lit and smelling of meatloaf and cabbage. So we can see there's really two big differences between where her brother is and what it's like right now in their apartment. She also mentions that dad is trying to soak in all of the last sunlight so he doesn't have to turn on a light. Think about the time. We've already learned that dad is out of work. Turning on the light means you're using electricity, which means that costs money, okay? So again, we're learning some great things. I also think I love this writer. I'll bet he was the cat's pajamas. That is an idiom. The cat's pajamas. Um, that's one of the things in this story with the dialect of the time is there's going to be a lot of phrases that we might not be familiar with. And so you can use context clues to help you figure out what those mean. So we know he was in a talent show. He was wearing a grass skirt. He was hula dancing. He was playing the ukulele. When someone says, he was the cat's pajamas, it means he was really, really good. It'd be swell to have our own talent show, I replied. Should I start sewing grass skirts? Mom asked from the kitchen, which was just the corner where someone had plopped down a stove next to a sink and an ice box. Now, come set the table. Dinner's almost ready. Dad stayed where he was, sullen and spent. Any jobs in the paper? Mom asked, her voice rich with sympathy. Dad shook his head no. He had worked as an artist in the theater for years, but most productions were still strapped for cash. It's another idiom, strapped for cash. Doesn't literally mean that these productions, these movie productions, have literal money taped to them when you're strapped for cash means you don't have a lot of money. Dad sketched posters for shows that did get the green light just to keep his skill sharp. He even designed posters for Rollitz Follies with Ruth and me depicted in watercolor costumes. For dinner, mom served a baked loaf of whatever ingredients she had that worked well together. From the reddish color, I could assume that she had snuck in beets. I guarantee you'll like these beets, she said, reading my frown. It's beet loaf, the meatless meat loaf, she sang as she served up slices. Ruth fidgeted in her seat, still excited about the talent show. Though calm on the outside, inside I was all a twitter too. Over the next week, Ruth and I practiced our Hawaiian dance routine. Our parents worried about heating bills as cold weather settled in. One Saturday, my father decided to grin and bear it and grab some hot coffee at the local soup kitchen where he hoped to hear about available jobs. Ruth and I begged to go along since the kitchen offered donuts and hot chocolate on weekends. He agreed. Most everyone in line was bundled up against the cold. Many of us had to rely on two or three threadbare layers. Threadbare means really, really thin, which is why they were relying on multiple layers. Thread is what makes up material. Bare means empty, so really thin, threadbare layers. Like many other men, dad bowed his head as if in shame. So I wanna talk a little bit about this, dad bowing his head in shame. Um, during this time and even in today's world, you know, here's this, this man, this husband, this father who is used to being able to support his family and now he's out of work and he's struggling. And so this is, you know, it's a lot for him to have to really carry on his shoulders that he's unable to support his family and he's unable to, to find work. So when he takes the girls and they go to this soup kitchen where they're receiving, you know, free coffee, free, free food. Why some of us might say, hey, that's pretty cool. We're getting some free stuff. Because of the timing, it's like charity. 
And so a lot of people during this time, especially men, felt ashamed that they needed this charity, that they couldn't just support their families like they were used to. And so that's why it says, like many other men, dad was bowing his head in shame. So he had his head down. The line moved slowly. Bored, Ruth began practicing her dance steps. I sang an upbeat tune to give her some music. Around us, downturned hats lifted to reveal frowns becoming smiles. Soon, folks began clapping along. Egged on by the supporting, supportive response, Ruth twirled and swayed like there was no tomorrow. Those girls sure have some moxie, someone shouted. They've got heart, all right, offered another. Why, they ought to be in pictures. Movies. It's what, what movies were called back then. With performances like that, I'd nominate them for an Academy Award, a woman called out. Those are my girls, Dad declared, his head held high. Everyone burst into applause. For those short moments, the past didn't matter and the future blossomed ahead of us like a beautiful flower. I couldn't wait to write Ricky and tell him the news. Okay, so you're gonna explore compare and contrast of characters and how the characters have changed um, and how they adapted from the beginning of the story to the end of the story. So in Wonders, you're gonna complete the Make Connections questions. Um, and something I want you to think about in that first Make Connections Talk about ways that Ricky, Ruth, and Shirley helped each other adapt to, to the times. So you're going to go back, you're going to reread and listen to the story, and you're going to focus on how did they help each other? What did they do? So I do have some sentence stems. Um, you can always write these down and then use these sentence stems to help focus your writing for when you get to the first Make Connections question. So Ricky helped his sisters buy. I want you to think about what did Ricky do? He's in Wyoming, but he did something that lifted his sister's spirits. Um, and then the second one is, dad was proud of Ruth and Shirley because. So think of what made dad proud. What did Ruth and Shirley do? And so again, you can use those sentence stems when you answer that first question in the Make Connections. The second Make Connections is a text to self. So it's designed to make you think about how you've adapted to a new situation. So you need to make sure that you read both of those questions in that section of the wonders to do um, and answer them fully. So if you have any questions about this text, please send me a message. Thanks.